Welcome to the general chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 56 to 60. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 56, we're asked which of the following is the sum of concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in pH 7 water. So we want the sum of the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in pH 7 water. Keep in mind the sum, not the multiplication. For pH 7 water, neutral water, you should know Kw is equal to 10 to the negative 14, and Kw is equal to the concentration of hydrogen ions and hydroxide. So Kw, the concentration, when we multiply H plus and OH minus, then we get 10 to the negative 14, which means individually, both of these are equal to, well, they're equal to each other, and then they're equal to 10 to the negative 7. But in this case, we're asked for the sum. So if we just add 10 to the negative 7 times, or plus 10 to the negative 7, we get 2. Because this is 1 times 10 to the negative 7. So adding them gives us 2 times 10 to the negative 7. So D is the correct answer. In question 57, we're asked which of the following is false of a chemical reaction in static equilibrium. So what is false about a reaction that's in static equilibrium? Keep in mind static equilibrium. Most of the times in chemistry, when we think about equilibrium, we're thinking dynamic equilibrium, which is when we've reached an endpoint. We're not changing the reaction anymore, the concentrations of reactants and products, but there is a little bit in back and forth where some reactants are turning into products and vice versa, and therefore their concentrations are changing slightly over time, but the net change is zero. So overall, nothing is moving around and we've reached our equilibrium but it's still changing. But a static equilibrium is when none of the reactants are turning into products anymore and none of the products are turning back into reactants. They've just reached an equilibrium point and have stopped there. So what is false about a static equilibrium? Option A is saying reactants are converted to products and products are converted to reactants at the same rate. This is something which is false because it's describing a dynamic equilibrium. So if you caught that in the question, you know that A is the correct answer here. Option B is saying concentrations of reactants and products need not be equal. Yeah, this is something which can be true. They don't have to be equal just because we're at equilibrium. They can be whatever they are. They don't have to be equal. Option C is saying concentration of products is stable and unchanging. Yes, this is true of a static equilibrium. And finally, option D is saying products do not react with each other to form some reactant. Once again, it's falling under the same term. It's the same thing. So D is also a true statement. So A is the only false statement. In question 58, it says poor metals are metallic elements which are found in the P groups of the periodic table. They are in fact metals and not metalloids. So which of the following would be the easiest way to distinguish a poor metal sample from one that is metalloid? So poor metals, these are actually metallic elements but they're in the P group which is near where we have some metalloids. So what's the easiest way to distinguish them? Poor metal from a metalloid. They're near each other and so it's hard to distinguish them. And when we have something which is a metalloid, we also know that this is something which is called that because it has some properties that are similar to metals and some that are similar, similar to non-metals. So in terms of conductivity, uh, metal would be highly conductive, but a non-metal would be kind of semi-conductive, whereas a non-metal, sorry, a metalloid would be semi-conductive, it's in the middle, and then a non-metal would be not conductive. So, so that's, one way which we can differentiate them. If we kind of think about the features that metals should have, and then non-metals, sorry, metalloids will not have those, that's how we can distinguish these samples from each other. So option A is saying color of the raw sample. That's not one way we can, we can distinguish them because if they're found in you know similar groups and we're told that there's things which, it's not that easy to distinguish them from a metalloids, it makes sense that their color is probably going to be similar. So just by this visual aspect, you can't differentiate them. Option B is saying the conductivity of the samples. Yes, this would probably be 
the easiest way. Just take a property that you know that metals have, and then it's going to be different in metalloids. So if you just measure the conductivity of two samples, the one which is highly conductive will be the one that's metal, and then the other one is probably a metalloid. Option C is saying the number of valence electrons. No, because we're told that these are in the same group. So remember in the periodic table, we group things up based on the valence electrons. So if things are in the same group, then they have the same number of valence electrons. So we can't use this as a distinguishing factor. And finally, option D, highest electron orbital, we can't use that one either because we're told these are in the P groups. So your highest electron orbital is going to be P for both the metal and metalloid sample. So once again, the best way to distinguish is an actual characteristic that's difference between that's different between metals and metalloids, and that would be option B. In question 59, it says a cobalt 2 chloride, this, well, this thing, this molecule can form multiple hydrates. Which of the following is a correct molecular formula for cobalt 2 chloride hydrate with a molecular mass of 238 grams per mole? So it can form multiple types of hydrates. As you can see in the answer options, it can have one water molecule attached, or two, or four, or six, but we're given this molecular mass. So this thing can form multiple hydrates. We want to know the correct molecular formula. So this is essentially just going into your periodic table, seeing the molar masses of cobalt chloride and then as well for water, and then adding that up and seeing how much we actually have compared to 238. So cobalt is around 59 molar mass, chloride is about 35, and we have two chlorides. So cobalt chloride here is about 130 grams per mole and then if we take 238 and subtract 130 what do we get we have 108 grams per mole and then we know or we should know that water has 18 grams per mole so we just have to then divide this by 18 and we get 6. So once again we got the molecular mass for cobalt chloride which is this much. When we subtract it from 238 which is the molecular mass that we're given then we know that the rest must be water and so we can use this to figure out how much water we have. Water has oxygen which is 16 molar mass and has two hydrogens each of which have one molar mass so it's 18. So we divide this by 18 we get 6. So we have six water molecules attached when we have a molar mass of 238. So D is the correct answer. That's the hydrate that we have. This is the correct molecular formula. In question 60, it is asking us which of the following describes the entropy change for the following reaction. So we want to know the entropy change for this given reaction. So two things to keep in mind. One, on the left side, we have three plus two, five moles. And on the right side, we have three plus one, four moles. So we went to fewer moles. If you have more moles, you have more disorder. And that's what entropy is. It's going towards a state of higher disorder. But the most, most important thing to keep in mind is on the left side, we have gases. And on the right, we have solids. And of course, you should know that solids are much more packed and ordered than gases are. So if we're going towards the products, we're going from gases to solids. Therefore, we are decreasing entropy because we are becoming more ordered. And similarly, but to a less extent, the moles play a factor as well. But both of those are telling us the same thing. When we go towards products, we have less disorder, more order. So option A is going to be correct. Entropy is less than zero. Option B is incorrect. C is incorrect because it's saying entropy is not changing. D is saying that the answer cannot be determined from the given information, but it can be. Just think about, based on what you have, first of all, what is entropy? And then based on what you have, can you tell if order is being changed? And yes, you can. So it is the correct answer. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here. And in that course, we have a lot of things such as customized MCAT schedule and lecture videos and much more. So make sure to check out our course. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at 30daymcat at gmail.com. Here are some reviews for our course and make sure to follow us on Instagram. That's it for this video. Make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here, and I will see you guys in the next video.